I'm Matthew, and I'm not going to do what I thought I was going to do 10 seconds ago. I like, I printed out this story that I wrote um, this afternoon, and I was like, no, I'm going to like read from my new picture book, because it's a new picture book, and it's retelling of a story from Val Shem Tov, and like, you wouldn't know that unless I told you it, but um, we'll, we'll do that later. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a story. Sorry, I'm a little bit jumpy. Um, and the mind hasn't done anything about it. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming here. Thanks for like allowing those of us who are Bali Shuva to like come out and admit it in a free and supportive atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it's like people assume you are, either that or you're related to the altar of it. Yo, Kevin in the car is like, yeah, I'm related to the altar. Yeah, this is a short story. It's called Praying in Strange Places. And it goes backwards, but you'll see. Five. A Hollywood backlot last week. I was there to visit a friend who'd recently gotten a semi-regular job as a minor character on a major sitcom. Actually, she was my best friend's girlfriend. But I was in LA, and my friend wasn't, and the girlfriend invited, invited me to come work with her. They were rehearsing, running through the same three-minute scene an infinity of times. I sat in the empty audience bleachers and watched them walk around the fake living room. I envied the ability to, do, to be able to do what they did, to rewind time again and again, to make it perfect. Inside this sealed warehouse, I got the sense that the sun was going down. I went outside to the hallway and found a place, a place to pray. Three steps back, three steps forward, I transformed that little area into a chamber for Hashem to inhabit. I stood still and swayed back and forth. The place I'd picked to pray was one of those narrow alcoves, a cubist lump where the wall hiccuped inward for no apparent reason. The wall faced east toward Jerusalem, and I fit neatly inside. It was only after I'd gotten far enough into the prayer so I couldn't move. Once you did your dance of three steps, I was frozen in place until the concluding section hit. You guys know that. When I realized, inside my sandwich of three walls, I was literally two steps away from the men's back. I pushed it out of my mind to keep focused on the prayers. Pushed it out of my mind to keep focused on the prayers. One of the stars of the series brushed past me and into the bathroom. Our shoulders actually touched, even though the, even though the hallway wasn't that narrow. I wasn't sure why. If he was coming on to me, if he was drunk, if he was just clumsy like I was. I tried not to listen, but can you close your ears? How can you willfully not hear something? The stream of liquid was long, unbroken, stretching to whole minutes. A strange thing, I'd long had this thought, I'd love to be an actor, except for the long periods on stage and the infrequent time mandated pee breaks. I wondered how they did it. This was how. Do you know there's a prayer we say for you? Did you got did you know there's a prayer we say for going to the bathroom? Thanking God for the, creating the system of openings and closings in our bodies, <laughs> acknowledging that if those tubes and combines didn't work exactly the way they did, we'd be poisoned, immo immobilized, unable to live. We say that prayer every time we urinate or defecate after washing and leaving the bathroom. It was not, however, a part of the normal afternoon prayer, the prayer I was supposed to be saying right now. The series star extracted himself from the bathroom, shook his hands off in the air upon leaving, far enough away from his body so no loose drops were shaken onto his outfit. He gave me a long, hard look, as if he'd heard my every thought, my entire rambling eschatological intrusion into his pee break, the kind of look he probably routinely gave to paparazzi, a look that said, don't you have anything better to do with your life? Nope. No, I thought, I do not. Four. Living in the city got too expensive, remember we're rewinding time. <laughs> Living in the city got too expensive, or maybe it was just too stressful. Either way, it felt like the right excuse. I surrendered my apartment and found a house for rent. A whole house, a 20 minute walk from the last stop on the subway. On the way home, I passed goats. Goats. I shook hands on the least in early summer, but by autumn, the commute was wearing thin. The porch got too cold to be inviting in the evenings, and the walk grew familiar and boring. At first, boring was what I was looking for, then it was just boring. I used to pray the sunset service in the drawing room, which I kept gloriously empty of furniture, just a blank room, nothing to distract me but my own thoughts. One window was stained glass. In the afternoon, sun shadows played across my face, dancing in distracting color. I convinced myself I was being so holy, thinking of God all day. I no longer had other things to think about. That wasn't holy. God created a whole world to distract us. And anyway, God in isolation is simple, too easily believable, taken for granted. God loses that complexity, that glorious screwed up, up that glorious screwed upishness of perfection, God, and flaw, creation, that makes our servitude meaningful. This act of cutting our afternoon this act of cutting our afternoons in half 
just to sing praises to someone who never answers back. The days grew short. It was daylight when I got into the subway after work and dark when I came out. I had to start praying on the train car. It swilled and swerved madly. I stood still and faced toward Jerusalem as best I could. When spring came, I gave notice to my apartment, to my job, to the subway too, to the very city I'd once wished for. I thought about heading east to where I was from, the direction I faced when I prayed. No, I liked the West Coast, the easy, compromising hiddenness of the place, the feel of emotion behind me, as if it were my enforcer. I'd head south, I thought. I'd try out LA. Part three. The roof of my ex-girlfriend's house. I stood between beds of hydroponic plants. Yes, there is pot. Of course there's pot. But there's also cardamom pods, jalapeno, basil, basil. My own beloved cilantro. I'm writing this in past tense after the fact, but even then she was still my ex. I was still over there first thing in the morning. Even when something's wrong, you don't necessarily stop doing it. And even when you're doing something wrong, that's not the only thing you're doing. We were so bad for each other. We kept craving each other. And neither of us was very good at saying no. No isn't all I said, for the sin which I committed and the sin which I am about to commit. But in that moment, the moment I was on the roof, surrounded by light and air in my prayer shawl, nothing in my head but some thousand-year-old words, I was doing all right. These days I prayed earlier than I ever had before. So on time, I might, have, I might as well have gone to shul if there had been a shul nearby. It was her snoring that did it to me. She had a long, sorry. She had a long, gorgeous equine nose. It was like an airplane co cockpit or a punctuation mark. But her snore shocked me away, reminded me I had other concerns, that the totality of the universe was not her. Four. No, two. Outside a lesbian club. I'd been living in San Francisco for a few months in a gay neighborhood. Most of my friends were gay. My roommates were gay. I'd always had gay friends. It was an occupational hazard of being one of the kids that don't fit in. In a small town, you all get lumped together. The gays, the Jews, the Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> that part is true. This was the first time I was actually surrounded by them, that I could truly call myself my own token straight friend. At nights, I went cruising with them. They cruised, I didn't. It was the first time in my life I actually appreciated bars. I was like a spectator, not in that creepy way. That was what I told myself. But sort of an accessory to the act. A wingman on some nights, an artistic appreciator during others. There was a woman there in long and flowy clothes, someone who I kept staring at because I thought we used to know each other. And then I realized she was on TV. She was trying to talk to my roommate. My roommate kept, was giving me signals, secret signals we'd made up as a joke but were turning out to be serious. At first she rubbed her nose along the left nostril. That meant she wanted me to stay to actively engage her in conversation whenever I could. The TV girl was forceful. She acted like she owned everyone there. Because I was the straight guy and because I had no expectation of the night, I acted out of character, saying everything I was thinking of, whether or not it was clever, boasting of a storm. Then something shifted, something I couldn't tell, a change in the weather or the atmosphere. She raised her right eyebrow at me twice in rapid succession. I, I've been practicing that all day. I didn't think it would work. That meant back off. I went to the bathroom. There was a tiny window that looked like a nail slot surrounded by dirty red graffiti like congealing blood. It gleamed. It blazed. It was brilliant and ominous, the last rays of the setting sun. I left without using the bathroom. I didn't need to use the bathroom. I just wanted to see what the men's room in that bar might look like. <laughs> I ran outside on the corner into the consternation of the bouncer and the surprise of several frat boy tourists pouring through the neighborhood. I stood to the side of the bar's doors. They were adorned with lesbian bar pictures, and I prayed, I prayed. One, my parents' house. This is the room that secreted my everything. The Doctor Who scripts I wrote as a child, the toys I stole from my friend Cameron's house, virtually every, every act of childhood sexuality until I refined it. I spoke to God every night for years in bed, and then I stopped believing him, in him. I didn't start again until I moved out. I've never had to think of this before. Standing in the center of my bedroom, which way is Jerusalem? I actually don't stand in the center. I stand by the window, facing a wall. A Hasidic master said you should always stand near something sturdy, a tree or a wall, so that it reminds you how flimsy you are and gives you a reason to cry out to the Almighty. I pray, the Talmudic sage's words, not my own, a script passed down, more coherent than anything I could manage to come up with. The Hebrew syllables still unfamiliar on my eyes and my mouth. I hold the book in front of me and I hold it closer until the words blur together. From long ago, they come back to me, some of them. <laughs> A tune, a trickle of pronunciation. 
I don't see God in these words. I don't know why I'm doing this. Other things I've recently started to do, blessing my food, not using electricity on Sabbath, they all feel like sensible things. Well, within the basic it doesn't make sense framework of God told me to do this, because they're so purposeful, so symbolic, that of course I should be doing illogical things. Sabbath, because God rested and so should we. God gave me this food, therefore I should say thank you for it. But praying, talking to God in a language I don't speak, it feels useless, utterly not my own. Something I'm only doing because God wants me to. And that's when I start to understand it. Thanks.